That's but pretty good. Or, let, let me, uh, or let me, you can give me an example of what you're talking about. Well, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. You wrote this okay. on September 12th of this year. You said, this is a tweet, I tweet so many attacks on our bad, lazy work of the press, I doubt I'll ever be voted to win a journalism award again, which is also a humble brag, by the way. But the next day you say, quite ironically, and I'm quoting, I believe Trump was institutionalized in a mental hospital for a nervous breakdown in 1990, which is why he won't release his medical records. Do you see a little irony that on one day you're criticizing the press for being lazy and inaccurate, and the next day you yourself are being <laughs> let me, lazy and let inaccurate? Let me give you what the question is the journalist would ask. A journalist okay. would ask the question, why did you send that tweet? I will answer it for you now. I've been covering Donald Trump. I started writing about him in the late 1980s. At that time, I obtained his medical records from his real doctor, not from this guy right. who sent out a medical report then. It showed that in 1982, he was given a very heavy prescription for an amphetamine derivative, and he remained on that prescription for many years. I knew from people inside the Trump organization that uh, they were deeply concerned about his condition, that he was getting reckless, that he was getting um, impulsive, that he wasn't sleeping, that he was speaking with these sort of great variations of grandeur, that he could do anything. And uh, in 1990, because he did so many deals that were so reckless, uh, his whole empire was going into bankruptcy and he was going through a divorce. And I was told that there was and now let me say, I'm talking about reporting process. So I'm saying here is what I was told. Was he in a mental hospital or that, not in 1990? You alleged that he was. Was he or wasn't he? He wasn't. Can, was can, he? I, can I, I mean, Tucker, if you don't want me to answer the question, I, I'm asking so, you the question. Was he in a mental hospital in 1990 But I would or like not? to answer the question. You've made an okay. accusation. Let me answer. No, I read your tweet. So in, in 1990, I was told that there was in, uh, essentially a breakdown. I'm giving reporting process here, okay? Clearly, I didn't print it. Uh, I also thought Trump was a private individual and that it didn't matter, you know. Well, you've been um, it right here. And that, as a, and this was as a result of the um, uh, amphetamine derivatives that he was taking. Um, many, many years pass, and we have now the election. Now, up until that point, prior so this to is the a election, very long story. He was you said he was in a mental hospital in 1990. Was he or wasn't he? Can I finish, it's a really Tucker? Simple if you don't I'm like you the answer, please answer the if question. If you don't like the answer, don't have guests. But I would really like to answer Chris, your question. It's now, a simple question. Forward, was he in a mental many, many hospital, years. as you claimed, or wasn't he? Tucker, would you like me to answer the question or okay. not? If the answer but, is no, say so. Please but succinctly don't answer the question. You You're want an answer if you weirdness. won't let okay. me answer the question. Kurt, we can go, go back and say, oh, here are Tucker Carlson's falsehoods. Let's go through them one okay. at a time. Kurt, I urge you, you. I will send these to you. You can put them right. on the Fox News website. Okay. Do you want me to go answer ahead. the question or not? Just give this me a yes or no. Do you want me to tiresome. answer the question? Yeah, I want you to answer okay. this question. Was he in a mental hospital in 1990, as you alleged, let or was he not? Let me answer the question. Go ahead. You are. Look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. So let me okay, give Kurt, you the answer. This is a little nutty. So, I got to be honest. I'm asking you okay, a very question. I also crisp noticed question. earlier this week you take people off the air when you don't like what they're saying. So okay, let's Kurt, keep I'm me on the air. Time. Let's finish this. Okay. You're making accusations okay. against me. You, I have the right to I'm respond. I'm reading what you wrote. Um, you so, you described Trump as a quote paranoid, Tucker, unstable nobody man. Nobody is getting fooled by this. You're not letting me answer the question. Okay. So I think let's that go you're humiliating to, yourself by uh, your unwillingness to answer a simple question. So please answer it. Last I am time. trying to answer the Do you question. Have evidence Unfortunately, he was in a unlike in on your world, you? reality is not always able to give you a yes or no answer. If you don't, <laughs> look how much time we are wasting with me trying to say, let me answer your question, and you refusing to allow you. me to do I think it. I'll go crazy. So okay. I will continue. All right. What happens then when we get to. Um, uh, I begin to see Trump's behavior got very normalized in the 2000s. During the presidential election, I begin to see the same behavior, the impulsiveness, the lack of sleep. I mean, that's the same thing this that he just, was this doing. This is just you stupid, Kurt. I'm sorry. Nobody's getting anything the, out of this. The, I'm asking you a plain other, question. You're not answering or filibustering. Be, all Let's move on to something Trump, else. Can, not, can, can you Tucker, stop? This is not interesting. No, Tucker. Let me ask, I am not allowing you to, ch to make an accusation and then I'm not, not making allow an accusation, me to answer. Kurt. That is I'm, obscene. I'm, 
It asking is not journalism. you to substantiate a claim that you made. If you want to have a dialogue, <laughs> don't have guests. So Can I'm I just ask you one last question? question? And nobody's getting fooled. You're trying to How stop. can Newsweek employ so, you as a reporter, Kurt, when you're throwing <laughs> lines like this around that are untrue, that you can't substantiate, when you say to the president's Tucker, spokesman, you F not, well, you, you, that's not the you, behavior of a look, reporter. Okay, let's go here. Ah, let me take one for you. How can Fox okay. News employ you? You really want okay. to do this? Do you really want to play this game? Or do you this want me to answer? This is performance art. I've I never had we an interview like this in my this life. On Newsweek.com if you want. I can tweet okay. it all out if you want. I'd all like right. you to put it up on the Fox News website. Or right. you can let me answer your question. I, I, I think, think you may, I, think may be coming on How about Begging this? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer this question. Do you have evidence that he was institutionalized no, in a mental hospital in 1990? Still on 30 the seconds. Now, Okay, I will say this, because it's a message I've got from people from the CIA. Uh, I know a lot of officers, I know a lot of agents, I've been in their homes, and they're really delivering this to you and to Donald Trump. Uh, these are people who have sacrificed a lot for this country. They What's go the through message? into the CIA every day, they walk past that wall with 117 black stars. I get it. What's the message? Stars. You, if, if you're going to say that we can't talk about the fact that there are 117 patriots whose lives have been lost serving this country. That's fine. I have con right I'm starting now, to get, have, have concerns about you, in, Kurt. Right now, tell me what the, the secret message from the CIA is. Who are putting their lives on the line, who are to be sources of information for the CIA. That information is coming in. That information is then being put together by analysts who are uh, not well paid, and they do very hard work, and they do it yeah. because okay. they are. Patriots. I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time, Kurt. And, and I, I don't mean this I. in a and in a cool way. I, I would have real concerns if I were one of your editors, and I mean news. that. I'm not calling anyone a liar, it's but I am it's saying despicable. I'm concerned about your behavior on this show tonight. But thanks a lot for joining us. That's because and you I, won't I appreciate let me answer your questions. I don't think <laughs> okay. anybody's fooled. Thanks a lot, Kurt. I appreciate it. Well, Larry Lessig is a Harvard constitutional law professor who made a brief run for the 2016 Democratic presidential nomination. And he says 20 Republican electors will not and should not vote for Trump. He joins us now from Reykjavik, Iceland. Mr. Leisig, thanks all for coming on. So you wrote a long and I thought interesting thanks for having and me, smart Tucker. piece. Oh, thank you. Oh, there's a bit of a delay. Um, you wrote the smart piece, I thought, in the Daily Beast, explaining why this is constitutionally viable and why you think it's a good idea. And some of it made sense. Here's one part that didn't make sense to me. One of your justifications for the electors basically overturning the results of the election was this. You said the winner-take-all rule for allocating electoral college votes, which is not required by the Constitution, radically skews the voting power of citizens based simply upon where they live. That fact, you said, did not exist or was not apparent on November 8th. And I guess my point would be it was apparent on November 8th, and both campaigns knew the rules, and Hillary spent over a billion dollars trying to win according to those rules. So why would we call that unfair? Well, it, what wasn't apparent, because this is an idea that now has become quite pressing, is that this system conflicts with a more fundamental principle of winner take all, uh, of, of one person, one vote. And it's that idea, which I think would lead some people to say, you know, what the heck, we've only had this happen twice before, that the winner of the popular election was not the winner in the Electoral College. And why should that be the precedent that should determine who the president should be? Right. I, I understand that. I, but it does seem like maybe that's a conversation we would have before the election, before, you know, 62 million people voted for Donald Trump. Sure. It does seem basically unfair to change the rules after it's over. Yeah. So the point that we're making is just simply that these electors have a constitutional power uh, granted by the framers, this was their vision, to make a judgment about whether to confirm the results um, that would come from whatever this process is. And that judgment um, needs to be made in light of what they know right now. And I think uh, the important point we're just trying to uh, uh, advance, I'm not trying to persuade anybody of anything, we're just trying to advance the idea that they are free to make that judgment based on what they believe. Well, actually, you go on to try to persuade people to vote a certain way. You say, and I'm quoting now, you say there's a strong argument, a correct argument, I believe, that if an elector cannot vote for the candidate to whom she is pledged, she ought to vote for the next best candidate. That candidate clearly is Hillary Clinton in every state. And it is my view that if an elector is unable to support Trump, she has an ethical obligation 
to vote for Clinton. Now, that's not really constitutional analysis. That's advocacy. That's not really a legal argument, is it? No, of course it is, because what the Supreme Court said in Ray versus Blair uh, was that states can't force electors to vote one way or another, but they can create a moral obligation for them to vote one way or the other. And what I was saying in that piece, the piece you so kindly said uh, you thought, at least in some parts, was smart, uh, yeah. was that there is, in the ethical analysis, uh, a very strong presumption in favor of voting for the person you pledge. And that's what I believe uh, all these electors have. And the only question is, does something override that? And I agree that you might say that the equal protection argument is new and that shouldn't override it. But the real issues that are of concern to Republicans, I think, from what I've heard from people speaking to them, are the issues about the unwillingness to give up the uh, conflicts, to violate the foreign bribery clause, or the issues of the Russian election. These are issues issues that should weigh on the conscience of an elector and lead the elector to ask, does it make sense for me to vote as I'm pledged, or do I have an obligation in my, by, because of my conscience to vote for another Republican? Right. I mean, I think those are real issues, the foreign conflict one especially, and that may be resolved when the president-elect addresses it at a press conference in coming days. But my question to you, just as an American and someone who's paying close attention to the country, what do you think would happen? if a group of 538 people basically nullified the results of an election in which over 100 million people participated? Wouldn't that be evidence? In fact, wouldn't that be conclusive evidence? This is really an oligarchy and not a democracy. And wouldn't that cause chaos? I mean, it would, right? Well, I don't think it would cause chaos, because what this would do would send it to the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives would then have to choose. And of course, there are a significant majority of Republican states in the House of Representatives, one vote per state. So I don't think the result would result necessarily in a, not a Republican being elected, maybe even not Donald Trump being elected. But the, but the real point is this process um, is what the framers gave us. You don't like what the framers gave us. I get it. Let's amend the Constitution. But this process, <laughs> where they would have the right to make this independent, nonpartisan judgment is what we've what we've inherited here, right? Now, I, I understand <laughs> the anxiety here, but look, let's go back to 2000. One one justice, one justice of the Supreme Court stopped a process so that the person who won the majority vote didn't even have a okay. chance to see whether, in fact, he also should have won Florida. There wasn't a riot because of that, right? There wasn't there wasn't the end of democracy. Here, the only thing that we're talking about is the process that the framers gave us to say these people have a judgment they need to make. And I think we ought to let them make that judgment without threats from Donald Trump or without a process that makes them seem like they're supposed to be just cogs in a wheel. Right. They are Mr. officers. They are they're people. you got to go. Mr. Okay. Lessig, we're, our satellite's going down from Reykjavik. Thanks a lot for that. I appreciate it. Now it's time for Twitter Storm, our nightly forecast of social media's most intense weather patterns. It's always stormy on Twitter. Well, tonight, a dust storm of desperation is sweeping across Hollywood over the video we just showed you of celebrities, some of whom you've never seen before, pleading with electors not to vote for Trump in less than a week. Twitter, of course, had some thoughts on this. Dan Singer wrote, quote, watch this pathetic video. It makes a nice trivia game. How many of these losers can you name? I think I got three, five counting maybes. Huh. CLS Carpenter wrote this. Martin Sheen is the only one of these so-called celebrities I've ever heard of, and frankly, I presumed that he was dead. That is mean, by the way. Elroy said, well, it worked for the general election. Oh, wait, never mind. Maybe America doesn't care that much what celebrities think. And finally, Capital Steps tweeted this. Yay, we were hoping celebrities would keep telling us how to vote even after the election. Well, your dream has come true because they are. And that's tonight's Twitter storm. Up next, how many people have seen the parallels between Brexit and Donald Trump's popularity? Well, some have. There's another similarity, though, and you probably won't believe what it is. We'll tell you coming up. Also, Donald Trump's speaking tour continues tonight in the state of Pennsylvania, the candy capital of Hershey. Vice President-elect Mike Pence is on the stage now. We're waiting for Mr. Trump to take the stage in just minutes, and we'll bring it to you live. President-elect Donald Trump getting ready to speak in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We expect him at any minute, and we'll take you there live, of course, the second he takes the stage. As he tours the country, many Americans are discussing Russian Lastly. interference with this election. Lastly, so we polled it. A new Fox News poll asked registered voters who they thought Russia's attempts might be helping. 32% said Trump, 1% said Hillary, 59% said no effect 
at all. Huh. And yet you would not know that from the amount of attention that issue has received. Almost wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Uh, we heard, by the way, today from the Attorney General of the United States, uh, Loretta Lynch, that there is no evidence, the U.S. government has no evidence that there was physical interference with the election. You've heard dark mutterings for the past couple of weeks that perhaps voting machines in some of those key states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, could have somehow been affected by nefarious activities by Russian agents, and she all but confirmed that did not happen. Well, joining us now is Daniel Halper. He's Washington Bureau Chief for the New York Post and Lisa Booth, a contributor at the Washington Examiner. It is great to see you both. Hi, Tucker. So I have to say, I don't know if uh, you all saw it today, but a member of parliament in Great Britain, you probably weren't watching the House of Commons, but um, <laughs> Ben Bradshaw, he's a Labor MP, who was one of the leaders of the Remain movement, the anti-Brexit movement uh, in Great Britain, said, and I'm quoting now, it's highly probable that Brexit was orchestrated somehow by Russian agents. Daniel Halper, is this news to you? It is news to me, and I think it's <laughs> news it to, the, to the voters in Britain. Uh, look, there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know, and I think, there, I think that there's a lot of people who won't concede what they don't know. Right. We don't know what happened during the election. We don't know what would have happened if other things had broken other ways. There's a lot of, you can't prove a negative, so we don't yes. know these things. And it would be nice if somebody would just say, we don't know. And we'd like to find out, and we should do diligence, find out what happened, and then take it from there instead of what's strange about this whole hacking thing is con con conclusions have been drawn. President Obama has made his conclusion public, and then he's called for an investigation right. to be concluded before he leaves office on January 20th, and then those facts, you know, to be cut to come out. I don't understand the point of investigation. If he's already drawn his conclusion, maybe he should have waited for the investigation right. before drawing. Or I think, as he's put it on other topics, the science is settled, Lisa. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. I'm here today for one main reason, to say thank you to the incredible people of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. This is the first time the Republican Party has won the state of Pennsylvania in almost 30 years. We made history together. You propelled to victory a grassroots movement the likes of which the world has never, ever seen. It's true. True. Your drive your dedication and your love for your country pushed us across the finish line. And boy, did we get across that line, right? The patriots in this arena tonight stood up for themselves and for their families and showed the whole world that the American people still run our country. I will never forget you, and I will never, ever stop fighting for you. I will never, ever let you down, believe me. What a state. What a state. Well, I went to school in Pennsylvania, right? So it's... Let me take a moment now to recognize your great congressmen in attendance tonight. They were with me from the beginning. Lou Barletta, where's Lou? Where are they? Tom Marino. And Tim Murphy. And I just see in the audience, I didn't know he was here, Jeffrey Lord. Oh, he fights so hard. Oh, that's Jeffrey. 
It's so unfair. They stack up seven to one, but he handles it. CNN, they stack it up against him. They stack it. They are not happy with the results of this election, and it was a stampede. Uh oh, their camera just went off, folks. <laughs> Jeffrey, their camera just went off. I also want to give a very special thank you to the men and women of the United States military. Incredible people. We are in your debt, and we will never let you down. As part of our commitment to those who serve, we're going to rebuild our badly depleted military, and we are going to finally take care of our great veterans. We're going to take care, believe me. Our defense policy can be summed up in three very important words, peace through strength. And we're going to get the military going, folks. And we're going to, we are going to negotiate tougher deals. Do we agree? Yeah. Where we get more equipment for less money. For instance, you saw the other day about an airplane. Now, I have a nice airplane. But this plane is going to cost $4.2 billion. Air Force One. I don't want a plane to fly around and they cost $4.2 billion, believe me. 4.2. Not gonna happen. But we're gonna work with Boeing, and I didn't order it, please remember this. But we're gonna work with Boeing, we're gonna cut the price way down, way, way down. And how about the F-35 fighter? It's a disaster, it's totally out of control. Totally out of control. So we're going to get more equipment for our military, and we're going to get better equipment for our military at a smaller price. Does that make sense? Okay? Believe me. We're also going to stop trying to build new nations in far-off lands, many areas you know, you've never even heard of these places. Okay? We're going to stop. We're going to be so strong. We're going to be so respected. We're going to be so powerful, we're not respected now, and believe me, it's going to turn. And we're going to have this great, incredible, powerful military, but you know what? I don't think we're ever going to have to use it. And that would be very, very nice. It's America first. Be very, very nice. Instead, Thank you. Instead, my administration will focus squarely on the vital national security interests of the United States. And that means crushing ISIS and defeating radical Islamic terrorism. We're going to defeat it quickly. But to be a strong nation, we must also be a wealthy or a rich nation. Some people say, Mr. Trump. Now they say, Mr. President-elect. Can you believe it? Can you believe this? Just call me Donald, folks. Just call me Donald. But they say, Mr. President-elect, it doesn't sound good when you say rich nation. I say, we have to be a rich nation if we're going to rebuild our military, if we're going to build the wall, we have to be a rich nation. If we're going to, if we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare, we have to know what we're doing. And we have to be a wealthy nation again. Whether it's building cars, producing steel, or curing disease, we want the next generation of innovation and production to happen right here, right here in America, and right here in the great state of Pennsylvania. But, and I, and I have to tell you about Pennsylvania. So, 
you know, they were all saying, you just don't win Pennsylvania. Everybody thought for years and years that they were going to win Pennsylvania as a Republican. They call it the bride that got away, right? This is such an important state. And they were saying he won't win it. He's down in the polls. And I didn't understand it because all of these gentlemen back here, and these are tremendous people that love you, your congressman, they were saying every yard in Pennsylvania has a Trump Pence sign, right? And, and we'd go to rallies, like, look at the size of this place. Every corner is packed. Now, the press won't say it. Hey, press, turn the cameras. Show them, please. Show them. Show them. World's most dishonest people. These are dishonest people. Are any cameras? No, they're not turning. Look, they never turn. They never turn. What a shame. Very dishonest people. Very, very dishonest people. You know, the only way you know how crowd, how crowd, like you take a look at this crowd, right? The only way people sitting at home know is by the sound. By the sound. Yeah. True. That is not the sound of 500 or 1,000 people, folks. And outside it's freezing, and we have 8,000 people standing out there listening. So, but Pennsylvania is an amazing place. And I've been hearing, and I don't know if you want me, because I know you've been listening. You know, what we're doing is a thank you tour. Thank you, Ohio. Thank you, Iowa. Thank you to the different places where we won, swing states mostly, but different places that we won. And by the way, we won in a landslide. This was a landslide victory. This was a landslide. And so we went to Michigan. How about Michigan and Wisconsin? How good was that? That was on top of everything. And you know, they didn't want to call Pennsylvania. You saw that, right? Remember? It was stuck at 99% all night long. And if I lost 100% of the remaining votes, I would have won by a lot of votes. But it was stuck for hours and hours. Now, I don't know if they did that because they were so devastated at what was happening or because they wanted to keep it going because they were making it. You hear the, or the audience they had? The audience was record setting. And I think they wanted maybe to prolong the evening for commercial sake, right? But it's one of those two reasons. Maybe it's both. But I will tell you, and I've been going and I've been saying this. I said it the other night in Wisconsin. And if you want, I'll give you a little recap of the night. Should I or not? No, are you sure? Okay, and we'll make, we'll make this recap pertain to Pennsylvania, right? We don't have to talk about the other ones, but it is true. So I've been hearing for a long time that everybody leaves Pennsylvania thinking they won, Republicans. And again, almost 30 years, and every time they lose by a lot. So I thought we were going to win. These three characters were saying, don't worry about it, Mr. Trump. You're going to win. I'll tell you, Marino... He said, I've been doing this for a long time, Mr. Trump. I guarantee you victory. I said, write it down. He said, nope, I'm not doing that. Okay. <laughs> I wanted a guarantee. But right from the beginning, they were with me. But they felt so sure. The only problem was all, you know, I kept hearing all these things that nobody ever wins, even though they think Pennsylvania. So what happens is the evening begins and Ohio, what a great place. I had a little problem. You know, it's pretty hard to win states when you don't have the governor, right? Pretty hard. Pretty hard. But you know what? He's called. Would have been nice if he called a couple of weeks earlier. He called. He's been very nice. But, but we were supposed to win Ohio by two points, maybe three points. We won it by almost ten points, right? So, so that was good. And you know, we got those bad exit polls. You know, they were phony polls, okay? 
What they don't know is what's the purpose of them doing phony polls when you're going to know the real answer in three hours? What are they doing? They can't help themselves, right? So we got these bad exit polls. We really thought, based on the exit polls, it was going to be a very short evening, meaning bad. And Jared is here, and Ivanka, they called and they said, Dad, and you got to understand, I got home from Michigan at four in the morning. I made a speech in Michigan where I started speaking at 12.30 in the evening. That means on election day. That was my seventh speech of the day. Seven. And, and the crowds are all like this. And you know the beauty about a crowd like this? This place is packed. But there's a difference between before the election and after the election, right? Before the election, you people are like wild beasts, wild animals. We're going to win. We're going to win, Mr. Trump. We're going to win. They're screaming, jail, jail, prison. We're going to win. Right? Right? They're going crazy. No. They're screaming, we want the wall. We want the wall. Build the wall, Mr. Trump. Oh, we're going to build the wall. Don't worry about it. Okay, but it is true. There's a big, I was telling somebody back then, and now the crowds are amazing. And you know, it's hard to get a big crowd after an election. If somebody else, a normal person, came after an election, even after a victory, you'd have 15 people. People would say, we had enough, we're not going. And this place is packed. This is a big stadium, by the way. But there's something different about a crowd before the election, like when I was here a few weeks ago, and after the election. Before the election, they are brutal. They are so crazed. You're like crazed people, and that's good. I like that. And now, no, and now you're laid back. Hey, baby. Hey. Hey, hey onward, Mr. Trump, onward. Right? No, it's great. It's beautiful. In other words, you've won and you feel great about it and you don't have to go totally wild, right? It's much different. Oh, it's much different. It's different. No, it's much different. You're laid back, and that's good. This is not really exactly laid back, but it's pretty laid. So we had to win Pennsylvania, but it started off with Ohio. Big, big victory. And the one I like to tell is Texas, Georgia, and Utah, right? Because they started off about two months before the election. Now, you just don't lose Texas as a Republican. Right? You don't lose. And you don't lose Georgia, and you don't lose Utah. I don't think Utah's ever been. Jeffrey, has Utah ever been lost? Just keep saying what you say. You know what he says? He's like Ronald Reagan. That's all he has to say. It's good. <laughs> Donald Trump is like Ronald Reagan. We love you, Jeffrey. This guy takes such abuse on CNN. Do we love him? I hope he's getting paid a lot of money, because he deserves it, believe me. But. But it's sort of incredible. But what happened is they're saying Texas is in play. Texas is in play, right? Is that Texas? I said Texas has never been in play. And then I go to Texas, I make a speech, and we have an arena that's bigger than this one. It's packed. 10,000 people outside. And I say, how can it possibly be in play? But you saw it, right? So they say Texas is in play. Then they say Georgia. Now, Georgia supposed to win by a lot. And they have me even, right? And then they say Utah, and in Utah they have this character. I never saw a guy like this. No, I never saw a guy like this. This guy was like horrible. And they said, the third party candidate looks like he's got Trump in trouble. And my wife looks at him and says, you're not gonna lose. She knows more than she knows more than these dishonest people. And they knew it. They knew it. 
they knew it. So what happens, you know what happened, because you're watching. They had a record audience, the biggest they've ever had. And it opens. The polls open. And now they're closed. And now they go on live all over the country, really all over the world. And the first thing they do, Texas has gone to Donald Trump. I said, what happened? I thought I was... And they always started off with, we have breaking news, right? We have breaking news, like, you know, about 12 seconds after the show up. This is a state that I was supposed to be, like, go late in the night. We have breaking news. Texas has gone to Donald Trump. I said, man, that's good because I'm a little worried, you know. That's why nobody believes these people. Then about 12 seconds later, we have breaking news. Georgia has gone to Donald Trump. Right? Then again, now in my state of Utah, I love Utah. And I couldn't believe that I was tied with this guy. This guy. Nobody ever heard of him. Nobody. And he was saying, if he wins Utah, he thinks he can win the whole thing. I don't understand what we... I'll tell you, what he could have done is if he won Utah, except that we won by so much, he could have stopped us from appointing Supreme Court judges. That's what he could have done, all right? Bad, sort of a bad guy. So I watch this guy, and I hear that basically I'm tied in Utah. And the third one, they go, we have breaking news. Utah has gone to Donald Trump. Thank you. Oh. I would have lost Utah. So now I have these three that are like solidly, I mean, we won by a, I mean, Utah. Did you see how many points I won by Utah? This thing wasn't even close, like, like massive, right? He said huge. They were all huge. Okay, then they go to Ohio, then they go to Iowa, where I just appointed the great governor of Iowa, Terry Branstad, the longest serving governor in our country's history, 24 years almost, to the ambassador to China. He loves China. That's nice. He loves China. In fact, whenever I speak in Iowa, he goes, this is for years. Donald, would you do me a favor? Please don't say anything bad about China. So what? And I didn't, but I just appointed him ambassador to China. He's gonna be an amazing representative. He likes them and they like him. They like him a lot and he likes them a lot. So, now we start talking, Greg, because I was expected to win Ohio, but not by nearly as much. I was expected to win Iowa, but not by over 10 points. Nobody wins Iowa. So this is like a good story, because when my kids told me about the exit polls, which were nonsense, I sort of thought in my mind, well, I can't work any harder, so I don't feel that bad. I still felt bad. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Until the real polls opened up, right? So then we go down to Florida, and we start. And we're sort of leading, and we're leading, and we're leading, and we haven't even gotten to our area, and boy, do we love the panhandle, right? And we're leading a little bit, just a little bit. And then they go on the air, the opponents. We will win the state of Florida. The guy said, some guy, I never even heard of this guy. He said, we will win the state of Florida. And I said, wait a minute, I'm leading by a little bit and my voters haven't even been caught on yet, right? He knows what I'm talking about. So all of a sudden, they have another one, another consultant come out. They probably paid this guy $15 million for destroying her campaign, right? <laughs> These consultants are the worst. By the way, you know in the old days, if you spend less money and win, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. That's a good thing. I spent much less money. We spent a fraction of the money and won. You know, I'd have these guys saying, Hillary Clinton has spent much more money than Donald Trump. And I, when I say much more, I'm talking seriously. And then they say much more money than Donald Trump. And Mr. Trump is ahead by one point, but he hasn't spent enough money. I'm saying they're scolding me. I've spent less money and I'm ahead. No, remember this for the kids in the audience. 
If you can spend less money and win, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Okay. So, we go to Florida, and all of our people are out saying how they're going to win Florida. And they're saying, we have no doubt. One guy said, we have no doubt we're going to win the state of Florida. And then there was a story about all the buses, you know, because they had this unlimited money. And they had buses lined up all over Florida. And you know who used the buses? My people. They got into the buses and they said, go ahead. And they were all people with the red hat, make America great again. So, because the bus driver doesn't care. He just wants to know, are the seats all full? Yeah, let's go. Well, they don't care. Uh, thank you for those buses. So they're going to win Florida, according to her pundits and her geniuses and her pollsters. We have breaking news. Donald Trump has won in the great state of Florida by a lot. Right? <laughs> then the same pundits get on. And I could tell you because I had a great conversation with President Obama. And I said to him, no. No, no, no. Although this foolish guy, Josh Ernest, I don't know if he's talking to President Obama. You know, having the right press secretary is so important because he is so bad the way he delivers a message. He can deliver a positive message, and it sounds bad. He could say, ladies and gentlemen, today we have totally defeated ISIS, and it wouldn't sound good, okay? All right? I have a feeling they won't be saying it, but I know we will be saying it. But... But the president's very positive, but he's not positive. And I mean, maybe he's getting his orders from somebody else. Does that make sense? Could that be possible? But I said, when do you think... When do you think you lost, we won? And I will say this, look, from everybody's standpoint, when Ohio came out with those huge numbers, when Iowa came out with those huge numbers, and then huge, and then we won Florida. So, now the pundits go out again, and they're talking about the great state of North Carolina. We love North Carolina, right? <laughs> the great state of North Carolina. So, they say there's no way. You have to see how much more money they spent than us. Oh, but those buses were comfortable for our people. You have to see how much money they spent in North Carolina. And they said, North Carolina, you got to understand, I've won like everything now, right? I'm just running, South Carolina was great. So I have Texas and Georgia and Iowa and everything. Now we're coming up and Ohio, big state. And that was the other thing. You cannot win as a Republican unless you win Ohio. Remember that? And then we won Ohio. So it's looking good. Then we won Florida. But North Carolina was our firewall. Remember they said? Nope, you can't win North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, we have breaking news. <laughs> Donald Trump has won the state of North Carolina. And now you see these absolutely terrible, terrible, destructive people. They're getting a little nervous. They're getting a little nervous. John King, nice guy, he's got the map. He's good with the map. But his hand is starting to shake. You know, it's got... Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God, he won. Because remember they said before the election, there is no path to 270 for Donald Trump. Oh. But there's a path to 306, but there's not. So his hand is... So, now we win North Carolina. And now we get up to Pennsylvania. We are just doing great in Pennsylvania. In fact, I won it twice, right? I won it twice, because I won it. And then we had this scam operation. Let's ask for a recount. We won it again. We won Wisconsin. We won Michigan. No, I love it. I hope somebody else asks for a recount because I love winning. You know, we'll win it three, four, five times. Actually, they did a full recount in Wisconsin. 
And I received 138 votes more. Me, I got more votes. A scam. Remember I told you it's a rigged system, right? It's terrible. And not rigged for us, believe me. The other way around. So now we come up to Pennsylvania, and they don't want to put it. But I see we're going to win. In fact, I start doing interviews, because if we win Pennsylvania, it's over, right? So now I'm doing interviews, because it's at 99 percent, and there aren't enough votes for them to even come close. So people are saying, you can't do interviews now. I said, why not? There's no way. There's no way. So I start doing interviews. I felt very comfortable. They just didn't want to do it. But what happened? Now you watch John King, the hand is shaking, quivering. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump has won Wisconsin. Now that wasn't supposed to happen, right? Then he goes, oh, you could see he's like getting ready to throw up all over the... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Then they go, we have breaking news, and I kept waiting for Pennsylvania. But why wait for Pennsylvania? Because they said, ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump has won the state of Michigan. Now they're going, whoa, whoa. Now Wisconsin hasn't been won for 38 years. Michigan hasn't been won for about that or longer. I mean, it's like crazy. And I love Pennsylvania, but we didn't even need you guys. Isn't that terrible? because they waited so damn long. They took all of your glory away, right? Rob, Rob Gleason did a great job, and David did a great job, great job, great job. David and Rob, what a job. So now we win the state of Pennsylvania, and it's over, it's just, it was an amazing, I'll tell you what, it was an amazing evening. And the people on ESPN, sports people, they said, it was the single greatest event they've ever seen. They've seen football and baseball and boxing, and they said it was the greatest. So I just want to thank the incredible people of Pennsylvania, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Incredible people. Unbelievable people. And in four years, we're going to win it by even more. And let's ask you something, all right? By even more. All right. Let's get back on the, the subject of jobs, right? Because, you know, that's what we're here for. Enough with this stuff. For years, the jobs and wealth have been ripped out of your state and ripped out of our country, like we're a bunch of babies. Foreign powers have gotten rich, bleeding America dry, because we have people that don't know what they're doing or worse than that. And our politicians stood by and did absolutely nothing. And that is now all about to end, and it's gonna end quickly. The era of economic surrender is over. You, the people of Pennsylvania, are finally going to have a champion that fights for you in the White House. Because from now on, it's going to be America first. Remember that. People talk about how we're living in a globalized world, but the relationships people value most are local. Family, city, state, and country. Local, folks, local. There's no such thing as a global anthem a global currency, or a global flag. Do we love our flag? Do we love our flag? We salute one flag, and that is the American flag. And we're going to make sure the American flag gets the respect it deserves, all right? 
You know, when I watch the news at night and I see these punks burning the flag and stomping on it and burning another one and stomping. No good, no good. We're gonna, we're gonna maybe have to do something about that. What do you think, yes? Patriotism will be celebrated in our cities and taught very, very strongly to our children. And that patriotism will be the foundation of our economic plan, bringing jobs back to America. We're bringing our jobs back, folks. They've been ripped away. That's why we're going to lower our business tax. We're going to, and we are going to lower our business tax, big league, from 35% to 15%. Right now, we're one of the highest tax nations in the world. And we're going to be among the lowest, and we're going to have jobs come pouring back. We want to bring in new companies and new jobs to our shores. That's also why we're going to eliminate job-killing regulations. Cancel many executive orders, believe me, we're going to be canceling a lot. And lift the restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale, oil, natural gas, and clean coal. And we are going to put our miners back to work, okay? Get ready. Get those shovels ready. Another critical element of our jobs plan is a historic $1 trillion investment in our crumbling infrastructure. Our infrastructure is going to hell. We're going to fix our infrastructure. You know, we've spent, as of two weeks ago, six trillion dollars in the Middle East. We could have rebuilt our country three times over. And right now, we're in worse shape in the Middle East than we were 15 years ago when we started, by a factor of 10. Our bridges are deficient, our roads are in disrepair, and our airports are like third world countries. I am asking Congress to support the construction of new roads, bridges, airports, tunnels, and railways all across our nation. We're going to do it. And we're going to build it on time, on budget, not for three times what it's supposed to cost. And we will put our people back to work in the process. It's time to help get Americans off welfare and back into the labor market. Rebuilding our country with American hands and American workers. We're going to rebuild our country. We're going to do it ourselves, folks. My administration will follow two simple rules. Buy American and hire American. At the center of this agenda is fixing our absolutely terrible trade deals. I mean, NAFTA, you look at that, it's, it's been defective for 20 years. It's been defective from the day it was signed, it's been defective. Pennsylvania, congratulations, because you're just about at the bottom of the pack in this, has lost more than one-third of your manufacturing jobs since NAFTA. Just about as bad as there is in the country. Although I must say, Michigan and a couple of other places have actually done worse. Okay, right? But you're all going to do great now because we're bringing, we're bringing those jobs back. America is now running, listen to this, a nearly $800 billion annual trade deficit. In other words, all these people, they work, they make these trade deals, right? We lose almost $800 billion a year. Who are these people? Any, any business people in this large, large audience? You know? Hard to believe. Almost $800 billion a year, and we never make good deals. You know, do you, I actually said to my people today, they're going over Mexico, doesn't work. China is all-time record-setting. We're going to lose $500 billion trade deficit. All of these places, and I said, give me a good deal. You know what they said? There are none. We don't do with anybody. It's almost amazing that our country can even make it, but it's not going to make it for much longer if we don't get this thing going, okay? Now think of it. Think of it. 
It's, it is so terrible. We've lost, and this one I can't even believe, I say it all the time. We've lost 70,000 factories since China joined the World Trade Organization. Now, I used to say, who signed it? I used to say, who supported it? We don't care anymore, right? You know who I'm talking about, right? I don't care. It's a disaster. It's the greatest job theft in the history of the world. Nobody's ever lost like we've lost. All because we got sold down the river by our either stupid politicians or corrupt politicians, all right? Except for these three guys down here, they're great. They're good. A Trump administration will defend American industry and it will defend the American worker. You've got to be defended. It will defend the American worker. Boy, did we come out and vote. You know, they forgot about the American vote. They talked about everybody, right? They're going to do this group and that group. And, and by the way, women, thank you very much. I mean, thank you. Women. Thank you, women. I was getting killed. These polls were killing me, the women. Donald Trump has almost no women. And then I'd come and I'd see these signs. Look at those signs. I'd see these pink, beautiful signs. We did great with women. We did great with the African-American community. So good. Remember? Remember the famous line, because I talk about crime? I talk about lack of education, talk about no jobs. And I'd say, what the hell do you have to lose, right? It's true. And they're smart and they picked up on it like you wouldn't believe. And you know what else? They didn't come out to vote for Hillary. They didn't come out. And that was the big. So thank you to the African-American community. Thank you to the Hispanic community. Incredible. The Hispanic community was great. You know, they all heard the wall and the, well, guess what? People that are in our country legally, if they're Hispanic, they don't want people coming in and taking their jobs. They don't want people coming in and taking their homes. They want to see safety. So the Hispanic community was fantastic. And, and the evangelical Christians, unbelievable. We set records, right? Set records. And as a, I shouldn't say this, this is terrible, but as a couple of our pastors, Pastor Jeffress, a couple of them, Reverend Gray, you know, how good was Billy Graham? Was he the greatest, right? Well, he's got a son, Franklin. And Franklin Graham would say, and Paula White, and so many others that say, Donald Trump may not be perfect, but he's going to be the best leader by far. Right? May not be perfect. They were great. What great people. We set an all-time record in the history of elections in this country with the evangelicals, and that is really cool. And that includes what happened in the primaries. Remember in the primaries, I was going to lose all these different states because of the evangelicals, and then I'd win by 22 points. Like, as an example, South Carolina, like Alabama, like Arkansas, like so many, Kentucky. And they were all saying, wow, Donald Trump is doing fantastically with the evangelical Christians. He's doing fantastically, but I knew. But we did even better in the general election. So we had the all-time highest vote in the history of elections with the evangelicals, right? Our goal is to bring back a very beautiful phrase. Do you remember when we were young, some of us, some of you are so, you don't remember because you're so young already. We have a young audience. Do you remember we had stamped onto cars and stamped onto equipment made in the USA, right? Made in the USA, right? Even the young people like it. And frankly, if it said made in Japan or made someplace else, it wasn't considered good. It wasn't considered good. We're going to bring back Made in the USA. And we're going to have a lot of jobs come back. We're going to have a lot of jobs. And you know what? 
If companies leave and fire their workers, they leave Pennsylvania, or they leave Indiana, or they leave any one of the states we're talking about, or any state in the union, they leave and they go to Mexico or some other country, plenty of them, and they think they're going to fire everybody and they're going to have their product come right through those weak borders. Oh, those borders are going to be so strong now. And they're going to sell that product, and that product isn't going to be taxed, probably at a rate of about 35% for the people that live. And here's what's going to happen. You know, the people that write the articles, they say, Donald Trump is not a free trader. No, I'm a smart trader. Okay, smart trader. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to put that tariff on. Company leaves, makes their air condition. Carrier was very nice, by the way, I have to tell you. I mean, what they don't know is the people that did go down there, it's going to be a little hard to sell that product back in, but we won't talk about that. But Carrier was fantastic. They really were. And I hope you go out, buy some Carrier air conditioners, because they're just about, they're one of the few that are left in this country. And I told the people at Carrier, you saw all the publicity that got. And we have thousands of people, families, that are going to have great Christmases in Indiana now because of that. But I told them, you're going to make up a lot because you're going to do a lot of business and a lot of people are feeling very strong about what they did. But it's going to be that they will have consequences when they leave our country and think they're going to sell the product right back over a border, no tax, no nothing. Because you know what? It doesn't work that way for other countries. You look at what China's doing. China taxes our products going into China big league and they don't want us anyway. They don't even want the tax. You take a look at other countries. So when they talk about free trade, it's free for them, but it's not free for us, all right? Not free for us. So that's the way it is. But we have to be a rich nation again. And we have to be a safe nation. The murder rate in the United States is the largest that it's been in 45 years. Nobody knows that. They don't tell you that. Do you guys ever say that? No, they don't say that. They don't want to hear it. And we are going to support the incredible men and women of law enforcement. And we are going to bring this terrible crime wave to an immediate end, and it can go quickly. One of the greatest public safety threats remains open borders. I always say, there goes your safety, there goes your country. We will build a great, great wall, and we will put an end to illegal immigration. And we are going to stop the drugs from pouring into our country and poisoning the youth of Pennsylvania and every other state. We're going to stop it. We're going to build the wall. We're going to build the wall. We have to. You know, the Border Patrol, you know this, 16,500 great people. Because their job is much tougher when I win, because we're going to enforce the laws. They want to enforce. They endorsed me. First time they've ever endorsed a presidential candidate. ICE. The men and women of ICE. They're smart. They're tough. They love the country. They endorsed us. It's not me, it's us. First time they've ever endorsed. What does it mean? It means they have to work harder. But these are people that know what they're doing. We're going to break up the gangs. We're going to break up the cartels and the criminal syndicates, terrorizing our cities and our neighborhoods. And they're being terrorized. Just take a look on Long Island, New York, and you take a look at what's happening out there. It is really bad. And our Local police know exactly who they are and want to do something about it. And they're being stopped. So we're going to work on that. We're going to get a safe country to protect our country from terrorism and extremism. I will suspend immigration and refugee admissions from regions where they cannot be safely processed or vetted. We will keep 
radical Islamic terrorists the hell out of our country. We keep them out. We got enough problems. We got enough problems, right? We got to bring our jobs back. We don't want problems. And we'll build safe zones in Syria. When I look at what's going on in Syria, it's so sad. It's so sad. And we've got to help people. And we have the Gulf states. They have nothing but money. We don't have money. We owe $20 trillion. I will get the Gulf states to give us lots of money and we'll build and help build safe zones in Syria so people can have a chance. So they can have a chance. Ethics reform will be a crucial part of our plan as well. We're going to drain the swamp of corruption in Washington, D.C. Right? I will impose a five-year ban on executive branch officials becoming lobbyists and a lifetime ban on officials becoming lobbyists for a foreign government. And I'll tell you what else I'm going to ban. When we have our purchasing agents giving out billions and billions and billions of dollars of contracts to the military and to all of these people where they're buying airplanes, where you see these tremendous cost overruns, take a look at the F-35 program. Take a look. And the people that gave out those contracts, give me a break. We're going to impose a lifetime ban on people that give these massive contracts out, or even small contracts. You want to work for the United States? You work for the United States. You're not going to go to work for the people that build these planes and people that do the drugs with all of the different things. You know, the costs of drugs in this country, we're about the largest purchaser of pharmaceuticals anywhere in the world. And yet we can't negotiate the price. I wonder why. You don't think it has anything to do with the drug companies. Well, we're going to open it up. We're going to face many challenges. But this is truly an exciting time to be alive. The script is not yet written. We do not know what the page We'll read tomorrow. But for the first time in a long, long time, what we do know is that the pages will be authored by each and every one of you and you. You, the American people, will finally be in charge again. Your voice, your desires, your hopes, and your aspirations will never again fall on deaf ears. The forgotten men and women of our country will not be forgotten anymore. Remember that. You sure as hell weren't forgotten on election day, were you, huh? Did you hear some of them were saying, where are all these people coming from? Together, we will raise incomes and create millions and millions of great new jobs. We will repeal the disaster known as Obamacare and create new health care reforms that work for you and your family. We will reestablish the rule of law, defend the Second Amendment, protect religious liberty, and appoint justices to the United States Supreme Court who will uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. We will heal our divisions and unify our country. We will be a unified country again. When Americans are unified, there is nothing we cannot do. No task is too great. No dream too large. No goal beyond our reach. My message tonight is for all Americans, from all parties, all beliefs, all walks of life. Whether you are African-American, 
Hispanic American or Asian American or whatever the hell you are. Remember that we are all Americans and we are all united by one shared destiny. So I'm asking everyone So I'm asking everyone to join this incredible movement, and that's what it is. All over the world, they're talking about what's happening here. All over the world. Pundits have said, and I mean pundits that truly dislike Donald Trump, have said this is the single greatest political phenomenon that they've ever seen. And it's about you, it's not about me, it's about you. I am asking you to dream big and bold and daring things for your family and for your country. I am asking you to believe in yourself again, and I'm asking you to believe in America. And if we do that, then all together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you. Thank you, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Halper of the New York Post, uh, the bureau chief of the New York Post. Great to see you. Great to see you. Uh, Daniel Halper, what do you make of that? I think what's really striking is I've never before, I mean, until Donald Trump, seen a politician who goes around the country after he's won and gives essentially the same sort of speech that he gave when he was campaigning. And I think why you never see other politicians do that is because they always lower expectations once they get into office. Once they've won, they start playing it down. Well, you know, we, if, if you recall President Obama, well, we've inherited a bad economy. It's going to be a slow right. process. Trump was not backing away from anything. So in terms of ISIS, he's going to destroy it. In terms of the economy and jobs and immigration and drugs, he's going to improve all those things. And it's very striking that he's not backing away from any of the promises he made and, in fact, is doubling down. And maybe it's political naivete and the, and the reason he's doing it, but it's got to be very uh, heartening if you're a Trump fan at home. You're like, this guy is actually going to follow through. Now, well, that's whether no, he follows through, I, you know, that's we have we have time to determine that. But he's not backing away from the promise. He's not. And Lisa and Booth, as you listened to what he said, it really sounded a lot like his campaign speeches. Was it? Who's the audience for this? Is it people who voted for him, people who are not yet won over by him. No, I, mean, I think it's it's his it's his supporters. It's the people that stood with him all the time. And I, I think what we saw at the beginning was sort of him being defiant. And what I kind of loved about it, there was sort of like a trolling that was going on. Because right now you have this sort of coordinated effort by the media, by the left, to delegitimize Donald right. Trump. And we've seen literally everything under the sun been thrown at him as the reason why uh, somehow Donald Trump's victory was not uh, legitimate. It's the you know popular vote and Hillary Clinton really should be the winner. It's the uh, you know racism, fake news, sexism. Now it's the Russians is the, the latest scapegoat. Uh, and so I think what Donald Trump was kind of doing is you know sticking the the fork in the ground and saying, look, or the you know sword in the ground, something stronger than a fork, and saying, look, I, like he's sort of beating his chest. Right. I won. And he should be, because he was com utterly discredited the entire time through his candidacy, both in the primary and the general election, uh, by the mainstream media, by the left, by a lot of different people. And so I think this is sort of both, uh, you know, throwing a bone to a supporter, showing them, look, I appreciate the sport. I appreciate you sticking with me. And I also think it's sort of a defiance uh, to the people that you know didn't support him, the people that said he couldn't win, right, and the people that are trying to delegitimize him right now. Sounds right. What happened in tonight's Trump speech? Bill Hammer joins us in just a second. He also revealed something he did this weekend that he's never done before. Huh? We've got three minutes to guess what it is. Stay tuned. Donald Trump just wrapped up his latest post-election rally. This one in Hershey, Pennsylvania. 
the Candy Capital. And for reaction, we go now to the Friend Zone. This is where we invite one of our friends within the building here at Fox onto the show. And tonight, we're especially honored to be joined by our old pal, Bill Hemmer, co-anchor of America's Newsroom. How are you, sir? Nice, to be, be in, nice to be in your zone tonight. Well, I, we'd love to have you here. So Thank you're you. a master at analyzing things as they happen. Did you see any news in that speech? Um, I think... Um, it was Trump's greatest hits. I mean, if you get on the line, election night, he loves to talk about that, obviously, the media, Obamacare, military. Um, a lot of the similar themes of the past 50 minutes, I think. But by my gauge, it was 50% teleprompter, 50% ad lib. But that, that was just my, my reading of it as I sit here in New York. Uh, I thought the safe zones in Syria was news. Yes. Uh, and, and I also believe him mentioning Josh Ernest is very curious. A and the context for that, Tucker, is the following. I think the president-elect Trump and President Obama have played very nice with one another in public. Um, but this week, that sort of changed from the lectern of the White House. And that had to do with Russia and the elections and what Vladimir Putin's role may or may not have been. And I think Trump takes that to heart. Um, he's got the memory of an elephant. Yeah. And when he called Josh Ernest foolish, that foolish Josh Ernest, he could deliver a positive message and make it sound bad. I, it, I inferred from that that that's what Trump was uh, referring to there. I, th I think that's right. And, and they were clearly stung by it. Kellyanne Conway responded to it uh, also. So you were sure. saying, uh, you were telling me that you were just with Roger Staubach, one of, one of my uh, heroes. I spoke to him on the phone um, earlier today. I tell you what happened. Trump was at the Army-Navy game over the weekend, right? And he did a, an interview on CBS at halftime. A and what he said, Tucker, was, I don't know if it's necessarily the best football but it's very good, but boy, do they have spirit more than anybody. It's beautiful, uh, typical Trump. Um, Staubach was interviewed by a writer for the New York Daily News. Here's the headline. Staubach to Donald Trump, Army-Navy football players deserve your respect, not your insults. So in this three-page article, I'm looking for the I, I've known Staubach for a long time. Yeah. I don't know if he's ever insulted anyone <laughs> other than That's with a true. victory in the football field. And just so the audience knows, I mean, this guy, uh, Naval Academy, Heisman Trophy winner, yes. served the Navy uh, in Vietnam, a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, won two Super Bowls, MVP of one of them. I mean, he is he, he's about as American as they get. Uh, the one quote in here, Tucker, says um, service football from Staubach is extremely respectable and very competitive. They've won some big games. They're not in the top 10, but it's still good football. I really enjoy watching service football. So I called Staubach today, very successful real estate uh, businessman in Dallas, Texas, and I read him that headline. I said, Roger, did you say that? Uh, and here's what he said. That is far from the truth. First of all, I don't think Trump said anything <laughs> bad. He had a lot of good things to say. Um, I know the writer wanted to get into the anti-Trump thing, and I wasn't going to go there. A story like this is dishonest. He did not insult Navy, meaning Trump. I did not come close to insulting him, meaning Trump. That's why I don't even like to talk to reporters, Bill. Um, <laughs> But the cat's out of the bag. I mean, this thing is all over the Internet. Um, it's on CBSSports.com. It's at NFL.com. The headline in CBS Sports is this. Staubach goes to Trump over, over Army-Navy game insults. So, I, I mean, Tucker, just in the frame of this now, you have all these stories about fake news and what Facebook is oh, yeah. doing. I mean, this isn't fake news. I mean, it's a, it's a poorly written headline. And I would say it was entirely misleading, but this is the type of thing that's now being picked this, up. And you This is say. what you find when you re-report other people's stories. That's fascinating. So before we go quickly, yes. you have a life milestone to report. I'm especially proud to hear about this. You went hunting First time. this last week. Listen, I'm a, I'm a suburban kid from Cincinnati, Ohio, all right? But there we were deep in the wilds of south-south Texas, and we went quail hunting. And I, I, I know this picture sometimes... It can bother some folks, and I'm probably one of those kind of people that <laughs> tends to be bothered by it, but I enjoyed it. Um, I know you're a hunter, Tucker. Yes. Uh, I found it to be challenging. It required a lot of skill, a lot of teamwork, a lot of safety, and you're in the outdoors, which is one of God's greatest gifts that you'll find anywhere in the world. So there you have it, field and stream. Upland oh. bird hunting. One of the, I'm going this weekend with my oh, son. It's the best. Oh, you, yeah. It's worth eat, it for the dogs. Do you eat what you kill? We of did. course. You <laughs> wrap it in bacon. I'd eat a pine cone if it were wrapped in bacon. Yeah, it's all good. Let me know Bill, how that goes down. <laughs> I, I've done it. It's great. Bill Hemmer, it's great to see you. You too, Tucker. Thanks. Thanks.
Many people are noting the obvious parallels between the Brexit movement in the UK and Donald Trump's victory here, but now there's another, and you're not going to believe what it is. It's a remarkable story from across the Atlantic Ocean. Stay tuned. Joining us now is Nigel Farage. He's the European Parliament member who spearheaded the Brexit movement. Mr. Farage, thanks for joining us Thank tonight. You. So do you believe that Mr. Bradshaw has evidence to back up his assertion that the Putin government was likely behind Brexit? I think it's the most hysterical thing I've yet seen. I mean, ever since June 23rd, when we voted for Brexit, there have been all sorts of excuses uh, that have been rolled out. But now to blame it on Russian cyber hacking, um, I think they've reached the new low. I mean, look, we're seeing this concerted campaign here uh, in the States uh, to try and sort of say, well, Trump wouldn't have won um, unless Putin had intervened. Uh, frankly, 2016 has been a year of political revolution. The people have spoken. Yes. Uh, there's been massive change. And what we're seeing from the establishment and their friends in the liberal media, frankly, they can't accept the result. Uh, they're doing everything they can to try to overturn it. Well, do you know what? It isn't going to happen. So it seems to me this is a manifestation of an anti-democratic, small d democratic impulse where the people in charge are not interested in hearing from voters. And so they are making excuses for what is obviously, you know, voter desire as expressed at the ballot box and blaming someone well, else like the Russians. Well, the people, those in charge think they are cleverer better educated, more worldly, uh, you know, they can do a far better job uh, directing our future uh, than we, the peasants, possibly ever could. Uh, you know, it's based on this incredible arrogance. And if you look at the way the European project was set up, it was designed so that voters couldn't really change things. And how interesting that Hillary Clinton had seen the European Union as a model for a much bigger form of global common market. So, you know, Goodness, isn't it just right that Trump followed on from Brexit? And what we're saying is we want nation state democracy. What we're saying is actually we don't want to be talked down to or sneered to uh, by bureaucratic, uh, liberal, global media elites. We will make our own minds up on our own future. And you can try as hard as you want uh, to say that it's all some, you know, cooked up conspiracy by Putin. Nobody believes it. Uh, they just look yeah. like bad losers. Well, one, I mean, one common thread between the European elites and the American elites is they never blame themselves. So you saw in Mr. Bradshaw's comments, he's blaming the Putin government for the massive refugee flows into Europe. My understanding was that Angela Merkel of Germany kind of opened the door. And that is she that's did. the key fact. No, she did. In fact, what uh, Chancellor Merkel said in July 15 was, as many people as come, we can cope with them. And of course, what it meant is that 80% of people who came would never have qualified for refugee status under any formula. They were mostly young males in their late 20s uh, using this opportunity to come from all over the world. And what we right. know is not a single one of them had been vetted in any way to see whether they were linked to ISIS or not. So literally what right. Merkel did was to import terrorism into the European continent. So it's a total disaster that will transform Europe yeah. forever, and the elites in Europe are blaming not themselves but Russia. Not surprising. So what, what's, the, what's the next stage of this? So in the U.S. and in Europe, the people in charge have been repudiated but refused to learn a lesson from it. What happens next? Well, I have a big warning here because I was in the European Parliament yesterday morning uh, in Strasbourg uh, debating with Mr. Juncker, who is the, the president of the European Commission, the most yeah. powerful bureaucrat in the whole of Europe. Uh, and he now wants to push full on for a European army, a militarized European Union, uh, one that effectively wants to get rid of NATO, uh, using the excuse that Trump has been elected, we must now do this on our own, and in tandem with militarizing, a continued push to the east. And by that, what was said yesterday morning is visa-free travel should come in quickly for the Ukraine and Georgia. The association agreement with the Ukraine, which means it's effectively step one of the Ukraine becoming members of this political union. That's the push ahead, too. Uh, and I really worry. I worry huh. that we're going to see a European Union, wounded animal though it is, dying though it is. But before we get to that point, it's going to provoke some kind of con you know, conflict with Putin. And I would say to that British uh, MP, uh, who, who, who was looking to blame 
um, all of our woes on Putin. Whether you like Putin, whether you choose to live in Russia or not, why on earth would you provoke Russia? Why on earth would you stick, you know, exactly. push a stick? you know, into that Russian bear, because if you do, they're going to respond. And that's why I really hope that President Trump can change things fundamentally. Let's at least start talking to Russia. But let's also, be aware. But let's be aware that NATO is now directly under threat, not from Donald Trump, but from Juncker and the European Union who want their own army. Exactly. And, and the left in Europe has so much in common with the left here. They do want conflict with Russia. That's obvious. It's becoming clearer in the United States. Why is that? What's the impulse behind that? What about Russia enrages them in a way that, say, North Korea and Iran do not? Well, they have to have an enemy, don't they? And uh, what Putin represents, of course, for all his faults, but he represents a strong leader who believes in his own nation. Uh, they call it nationalism, nationism. They, they, they talk about these things in pejorative terms. Uh, of course, Putin doesn't like the European project because the European project wants to make Ukraine his next door neighbor a member of an alternative political right. and military alliance. You know, come on, you can't blame him for that. Uh, but no, I think all through, um, all through history, you see that uh, empires that are built, uh, that are struggling, that are failing, they have to have an enemy. They have to have a hate figure. Yes. And it's Putin. And it can lead to very reckless and destructive behavior, unfortunately. I, Nigel think, Brush. I think that's right. And I think that unless we stop yeah. this European army, we could be headed for very real trouble. <laughs> well, the, their first project would be to put down rebellions like Brexit, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining well, well, they can try. Joining. They can try, but they won't do it, I promise you. Well, keep, God bless. Thank thanks you. a lot. So are Russian saboteurs lurking among us, subverting democracy? Possibly. We'll ask Dr. Sebastian Gorka. He's got the final word on that. Stay tuned. Well, Russia's interference with November's presidential election has dominated the news cycle this weekend, last week. So let's take a deeper look into what exactly is being alleged here. Joining us now is terror expert, author of Defeating Jihad, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Dr. Gorka, it's great to see you. Great to be here. So what is the core allegation here? Well, the core allegation is that Russia as a state was somehow linked to the leaking of the Podesta emails. And then that is a bad thing, that somehow profited the winner of the election. But there's a real big flaw with that allegation, Tucker. Are the Podesta emails true, or are they desinformatia? Are they uh, manufactured fakes? Right. Because if they're real, you know, releasing them is, is naughty. But then what are they actually saying on the Democrat side? People shouldn't have known that Podesta undermined the democratic process, that they were taking out one of the Democrat candidates, Bernie Saunders, that they were saying nasty things about Catholics. I mean, if this is true, which I, of course it isn't, we, we know nothing about the intent of right. the people that leaked these emails, but in fact, they made the electorate more knowledgeable about who the Democrats are. Is that a bad thing? I mean, that's the question, exactly. And <laughs> right. I, so the question is, are these the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a forgery, right. or are they the Pentagon Papers? Something Correct. that presumably yes. American citizens have a right to see and make their right. own judgments right. about. Great, great analogy. Uh, so, so either we thank the Russians for helping the voters get access to information the Democrats were keeping from them, or the Democrats proved to us that those aren't Podesta's emails, which nobody has stated except one person, right, Donna Brazil, and nobody takes her seriously. I also wondered, and you spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, Could, do you believe the Russians thought that Donald Trump was going to win? Who knew who was going to win? Look at Brexit. Who got Brexit right? Right, that's right. Nobody got Brexit right. Exactly. The betting right. markets got it wrong. Totally, yeah. Uh, what was the, 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 the New York Times, Huffington Post said uh, Hillary Clinton has a 92% victory yes. rating before the election. So nobody knew what was going to happen. Why? Because they were listening to what? The mainstream media. Right. The mainstream media echo chamber. Right? It's Which, the, the endless loop of self-affirmation. Yeah, the, the Ben Rhodes, you know. Exactly. We need to feed the beast that is the echo chamber. Huh. Interesting. Special worker, that is such a good point. Thank you for making it. Thank you, Tucker. Great to see you. Well, if you missed our earlier conversation with Kurt Eichenwald, he's a senior writer at Newsweek magazine, you're going to get a chance to see the best parts coming up.
Well, if you missed it, earlier in the show, we had on Newsweek's Kurt Eichenwald. He's a senior writer at the magazine. He's been getting kind of wild on Twitter recently, so we invited him on to ask, what, what's that about exactly? And here's how it went. Do you believe that you're practicing journalism? <laughs> when did you stop beating your wife? Uh, get, what are you talking about? Well, I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. I, I read your Twitter feed, and this is uh, the kind of stuff I'm reading on it. At one point, uh, you ask of conservatives why do they hate America. You describe Trump as, quote, stupid and lazy. You, you refer to dumbass Trumpers. You say this to Kellyanne Fitzpatrick. F you. You well, say hold, this to hold Trump on voters. Again. Hold Go on F here, yourself. Tucker. I mean, one of the things I want to make sure of, you that have a real habit of taking a lot of me. things out of context. You're entirely entitled to your opinion. I just, my only point is that you ought to label yourself as what you are, which is an advocate. And so you say things like this. How can oh, Trumpsters okay, defend okay, a president Let's stop elect? for a second. Okay. You won't I mean, I can, give me I've got an example. I, I'm trying to give okay, you one well, right then, now. Then give me, Perfect. here, you know what? Let's play the game another way. I oh. spent a little while just sort of doing Wait, some no, research actually, on you. Let, why don't you answer? Let me, this let is me what ask I came you this question, with. if you Tucker would. Tucker Carlson falsehoods. <laughs> Okay. I want you to answer this okay. question. Was he in a mental hospital in 1990, as you alleged, Let or was he not? Let me answer the question. Go ahead. You are, look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. <laughs> so let okay, me give Kurt, you the answer. This is a little nutty. So, I got to be honest. I'm asking you okay, a very crisp question. I also noticed question. earlier this week, you take people off the air when you don't like what they're saying. So okay, let's Kurt, keep I'm me on the air. Time. Let's finish this. You're okay. making accusations okay. against me. You, I have the right to I'm respond. I'm reading what you wrote. Um, you, so, you described Trump as a, quote, paranoid, Tucker, unstable nobody man. nobody is getting fooled you by this. You're not letting me answer the question. Wow. And it got wilder from there. At one point, Eichenwald said he was going to share a message he'd received secretly from the CIA. You began to kind of worry about him by the end. You can judge for yourself. You can see the whole interview over on our show's Facebook page. Just go to Facebook and search Tucker Carlson tonight. Tell us what you think. You can comment at the bottom if you like. Well, that's it for us tonight. We're proud to have been sitting in Bill O'Reilly's hour tonight. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 and every night. The show that is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. See you tomorrow.